Good morning. So before I open us in prayer this morning, I just want to share a little God siding from this weekend. So um, many of you might know this, but um, there, this weekend has been the Women's Emmaus Walk, and I've had the opportunity to be able to help surf throughout the weekend and to just see the worship and love that has been poured out through this community. And it's just amazing to see that. And while I was there at all of these different worship events and stuff, it's, it makes me think, why are we not like that all the time? Why can we not feel open and vulnerable in praise and worship all the time, and especially on Sundays at church? And so my prayer this morning is a little bit about just being able to open up to the love of God and to be able to open up and worship for him. So if you will, bow your heads and pray with me. Dear God, thank you for opening my eyes this weekend to see the true love and worship for you. I pray that you may bless the rest of this congregation, that they may see that as well, and feel free to open their hearts to your love and be carried away in worship and thanks for you. God, I pray for those who are hurting or tired or mourning this morning, that you may be with them to carry them through their hard time. I pray that your church comes together to help those in need and to continue making disciples in Christ because we are called to make disciples in you. I pray that we can remember where we come from and that you are the one who deserves the true praise. God, I thank you for all that you have done in my life and the lives in this room and all that you will do for the rest of the world in the same way. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please stand and join us now as we sing Blessed Assurance. Yeah. 
Good morning. Today I'll be reading Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. The next day, the leaders, elders, and legal experts gathered in Jerusalem, along with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others from the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and asked, By what power or in what name did you do this? Then Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, answered, Leaders of the people and elders, are we being examined today because something good was done for a sick person? a good deed that healed him? If so, then you and all the people of Israel need to know that this man stands healthy before you because of the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. He has become the cornerstone. Salvation can be found in no one else. Throughout the whole world, no other name has been given among humans through which we must be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated, and when all of the children, please come forward for the children's sermon. Ah, that'll work. All right. Good morning, church. Um, I wanted to just give a brief um, shout out about uh, Vacation Bible School coming up. It is going to be running in early June, June 2nd through the 5th. Um, I will have some volunteer forms out today right out here in Gantt Hall on the welcome table. Um, If you do feel led, it does take 20 plus people to run a successful VBS. Um, So we do ask uh, that you will consider doing this with us. Again, they'll just be right out in the welcome hall. I'll have some pins ready for you for signups and you can just leave that form there on the table and I will collect them today. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all today. Were you all listening to our scripture? Yes, all right. Well, I have these two water bottles today. Kind of a strange thing to bring to church with me. But I have two of them, and you can see they're pretty much the exact same, but there's something that's a little bit different. What do you guys notice? Johnny, what do you notice? Can you say that a little bit louder? One is empty and one is almost full. Do you guys see that too? Yeah. One is empty and one is full. And it kind of reminds me of our story um, from Acts today um, that Landon was reading. And he was reading about two disciples named, did you guys hear their names? Did you hear them? Peter and John. Peter and John, that's right. And so Peter and John had done some miraculous work. They had healed a sick man. um, And everybody was kind of looking around like, oh, how did you do that? There was no way that he should be able to get up and walk, and now he's walking. How in the world did you do that? And Peter and John, it kind of reminds me of these spray bottles. It's like this spray bottle here is full, and this one is empty. And this spray bottle says to this spray bottle, hey, how did you spray that water? What happened there? And he says, well, I've got water in me, so it's pretty easy to make a spray. No spray here, though. And so Peter and John tell the elders, they say, well, we're filled with something also. Now, were they filled with water? No. No. Did you hear what they were filled with? Do you remember? The Holy Spirit? Yeah, the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus had taught his disciples really well. And he, he taught them how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He shared... Um, messages, and he shared his love so that they could be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so eventually, not only did Peter and John, not only were they filled with the Holy Spirit, but as we follow Christ and as we follow Jesus, we can share the good news with others so that they may be filled with the Holy Spirit as well. And so now, not only Peter and John can do 
miraculous or share the love of Jesus. But now, Peter and John, for the man that they helped walk, what do you think that that man went and did? What do you think? Molly, what do you think? I'm sorry, Jenny. Shared the Holy Spirit? Yeah, probably shared the Holy Spirit also. So not only was Peter and John, not only were they filled with the Holy Spirit, but now you have other people that are also filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. Guys, will you say a quick prayer with me, and then we're going to let Mr. Brent get to preaching. You ready? All right. Dear God, thank you for Peter and John who remind us that we can learn from Jesus how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, and to the congregation. So my number one goal this morning is not to be up here and be a uh, crying idiot, but we're starting off pretty strong, y'all. With the music, and with the prayers, with the children's message. Uh, uh, it's amazing already. I've, uh, I've been studying this thing called preaching now. I've done this a couple of times and trying to learn the craft, I guess you'd say, and trying to get better. And one of the things, one of the people that I've been following is uh, he talks about, he studies people's preaching. And he looks for three things out of the preachers. He looks for, one, do they read the scripture? Two, do they expand the scripture and talk about the historical context behind the scripture? And then three, do they preach the gospel? And I'm pleased to say that you should know that at Three Crosses with Pastor Leah and this church that we do that every Sunday. And I'm hoping that I can do that same thing for you this morning. And Landon's already started this off um, with the scripture. And so I want to give us a little bit of context. So um, as Amy was saying, Peter and John had just been arrested, right? They had done some miraculous things, and they'd been brought before the Sanhedrin to, um, because they'd been causing that disturbance. And so what we know about the book of Acts is that it starts with the world now living without Jesus on this earth. He's been resurrected, he's spent some time with him, and now he's ascended into heaven. And so in chapter 1, he's been here for about 40 days, and he's been appearing to the world. And he's been teaching the disciples, he's been teaching uh, the people, he's been visibly seen and felt and touched, and he's been there with them the whole time. But he told them to hold tight. And he said, hold on, stay together, and wait for the Holy Spirit. And they were obedient. And I think, well, that's probably pretty obvious that Jesus is standing here and they were obedient, right? It would help me a whole lot more <laughs> if he was in flesh standing right here. I would, temptations would be just not a thing, right? Uh, but regardless, he was there. They listened to him. They were obedient. And uh, they stayed in Jerusalem and they prayed. There was about, it wasn't just the 12 disciples. There was about 120 of them there. Right? So all the people that were, had been helping with Jesus' ministry. They prayed. Uh, they refilled the position that had been left by Judas. And they appointed Matthias to join the ranks. And they prayed. And they waited. And in chapter 2 of Acts, we, the Holy Spirit, the gift that he said was coming, arrives. Right? Jesus had promised that the Spirit would come and fill each of them. And he did, and he came and he gave them each the ability to speak to the world and that the world would hear Jesus' words in their own language. That's the miracle number one that we're going to talk about today. And this is where Peter really steps up, right? So after the Holy Spirit has hit, things start to happen. And the people of Jerusalem are hearing Peter and the disciples and the 120, they're hearing 
Jesus' words in their own language. And there's tons of people here, right? Because when we're in Jerusalem, 40 days, 50 days before was Passover, right? And all these people were in there. They had welcomed Jesus into town, and they're there for this. And so they're still there, and there's people from all over the world that are there in Jerusalem and listening in their own language. But Peter's preaching now, right? So this is the first time he's really preaching, and he talks about Christ's divinity, how Christ is God. He talks about his lineage and how he ties back to King David, how he was the fulfillment of all the scriptures. Um, He tells them how the Holy Spirit had came upon them, and he tells them the gospel, and the Gospels repent, be baptized, and receive forgiveness in the Holy Spirit. And the best part of that preaching is that it was heard and that they responded, they believed. Just in that first interaction, 3,000 were believed, became believers. And remember who these people were, right? These are the people that were there 50 days earlier welcomed Jesus into town, and then crucified him on that cross. And so what's, what's amazing to me is that those same people that just crucified cross, crucified Jesus on the cross, were some of the first ones to be offered salvation. And so everybody had been gathered there. Um, they were there for the festival of weeks. Like I said, the period of time between Passover and the law being given to Moses and the Israelites. Um, And now that they're there, they've been witnessing Christ's apostles preaching, Jesus' resurrection, and many of them had the chance to see Jesus after the resurrection because Jesus was present for people and he was seen by many people. And so how amazing, again, is that forgiveness that the people that crucified him were the first to receive his salvation. But greater than that is Peter. What was Peter doing 50 days before? Right? He was cowering in fear. He was running from God. He was afraid of what was happening. He was denying Christ. He was running in fear. And he was unable to process what was taking place. But now, Peter is forgiven And he's able to preach of Christ's forgiveness because he received it. He knows what it's like. He's lived that path, and now he has the ability to share that with everybody else. And so in chapter 3, we see Peter, now that he knows his past, he knows his story, he knows all the experiences he's gone through, he's understanding the power of Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit is on him, and he's telling it to those around them. Just like Amy showed with the sprayers. He's filled with it and he's letting it out. And he walks into the temple courts, past a man, and in the name of Jesus Christ, he reaches out and he grabs his hand and he says, walk. And he heals the man. And everybody is surprised. I I wonder if Peter was surprised, but I don't think he was, right? Because he, he was filled with it. He understood what was happening, and he knew that when he said those words to get up and walk with me, that it was going to happen. There was no doubt in his, in his mind. But everybody else is surprised, right? They've gone through a lot in the last 40 or 50 days, right? <laughs> One, they thought the king was coming, and then they killed the king, and now the king is alive, and they're seeing this now, and they're surprised, and how is this happening? And as you can imagine, that draws the crowd, right? That's going to spread like wildfire, right? The knowledge of somebody who had been lame for 40 years, the guy was about 40 years old, now he's up walking and jumping and running around. And those same people that were surprised are those same sinners who crucified him earlier. And to hear this news and to see the miracle is just, had to be crazy. But Peter's first statement to them is that why do you look so surprised and wonder how we made this lame man walk? It is in Jesus' name that has healed this man. 
And so I've always wondered uh, how I might be changed if I saw a miracle happen right in front of me, right? What does that look like? Um, I remember as a kid, uh, had swing set in the backyard, metal poles, big metal cross tube, and I would climb up on that A-frame and I would put my ear on that cross tube and I would listen because I always I wanted to hear God's audible voice, right? And so I'd put my ear up on that and I'd listen. And I didn't hear anything but yellow jackets. But <laughs> I wanted to hear that God's voice. I wanted to hear that from the very beginning. And uh, the find that miracle. So what would that look like to me if it actually happened? And I've wondered what it would look like for that crippled man to stand, right? Did, it, did his legs withered and small, did they just inflate like a balloon? I know, how, what did it look like? The blind man, when a blind man is healed, does his eyes change colors? What happens during that physical moment? And we'll never know what that actually looked like, but the Bible does say that for this miracle, that the man's ankles and his feet became strong. And not only did he walk, but he jumped for joy. And so I want you to think about how would you react if you saw that? How would it change you to see that? And so on February 29th this year, um, I was in Nashville doing my day job and had a morning filled with meetings, and then uh, we gathered together, and we went to lunch. We walked a few blocks from the office downtown, had a great Mexican lunch, as everybody eats Mexican for lunch, and we were on our way back uh, to the office, and I heard somebody say, JT. So JT's a friend of mine, a colleague. I've been on his team uh, from the very beginning of my time working at TVA. And uh, I heard somebody say JT's name. And when I looked up, he was in mid-stride. He was completely stiff. And he was on his way falling backwards. And I watched him fall all the way backwards and his head bounce off the concrete like a basketball. And um, I immediately went to him to see what was going on. He was unresponsive. Um, I immediately started chest compressions on him. And there were, there was probably about a dozen of us. So there were some people that went and they started to call him 911. There were some people that ran about a block and a half down the road and got a police officer, got him back to us. Some of them were going into the local businesses and they were looking for AEDs to get him. Um, some waited at the street to flag down the ambulance. And there was, there's no doubt in my mind when I was watching him that he was dead while he was vertical. And he was also dead when he hit the ground. And, and I remember the sounds and the colors. I remember the way his heart felt in my chest and his hand on my hand. And, and at that time, I felt nothing but anger to God because of what was happening at that moment. And JT received CPR for 30 minutes total. Um, he received CPR from us, he received CPR from the EMS, and then finally at the hospital. And the fourth time he was shocked, he came back to life. And so I've, I've had the chance to tell this story a couple times. Um, I've told it to another congregation. I've shared it with my youth group, talked to the youth about it. Um, I'm now famous at TVI. I had to get up and do a safety moment, <laughs> which is great, right? So I had to get up and tell the story uh, for TVA. Um, but every time I tell it, I remember something different. I remember a little bit more about how it felt. And the story gets more and more amazing to me every single time. Because the first time I was focused on my anger to God for why is my friend dying? And today I'm focused on the power of God and I'm thankful for what he has done and the miracles that he's worked. And so I truly believe that God has used JT 
in my life to show me what it's like to witness that miracle, to see it firsthand. Because when I left him with the EMS and I left him at the hospital that afternoon, I still thought that it wasn't going to go the way that God took it. And so I, I think I understand now of just a little bit of the emotions that the disciples had to have been feeling. You know, I've watched my friend collapse and come back. They watched our Savior. They watched Jesus Christ die way more gruesome and painful than us. And he's back, and he's with them. And how exciting and how energizing it's got to be to see him in the flesh right there, to be able to touch him and to hug him and to hear him and to learn from him and to move forward. And so that's the lens that I'm reading this scripture this morning as I'm looking at it through that lens. And I know the miracle that God gave me uh, with JT. And there's nothing that would keep me from telling you that story. Now that I've got it out of my system at least once, now it becomes easier. And I want to tell it more and more in hopes that it helps maybe save another life just from the CPR safety, but for the chance that it impacts somebody else's life. There's far too many details that I can't go through this morning of all the other miracles and baby steps. If you look at all of the events that happened in JT's uh, recovery, everything has happened just exactly the way it needed to happen. And yesterday he texted me, this was February 29th, that he was dead. And yesterday he texted me and he said, I mowed my front yard. <laughs> right? And so that's the small excitement that he's getting. But he's alive and he's moving. And so back to Peter preaching to the people of Jerusalem with a greater passion than I can tell this story. Um, Peter has healed this man and shared with the crowd the story of Jesus. And, and like I said earlier, that's quite the disturbance, right? You see a miracle, it's going to cause problems. And so the Sanhedrin had to try to squash this. So they couldn't let this go. They had just crucified Jesus for the same reason, right? They did not want this uprising. But while Peter and John were being arrested, that 3,000 grew to 5,000 believers. And so now we're finally to the scripture that landed read for us this morning. That was all pre-story, right? And so now we're at Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. And I'm going to read that again. It says that the next day the leaders, elders, and legal experts gathered in Jerusalem. And along with Annas and the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others from the high priest family, they had Peter and John brought before them and asked, By what power or in what name did you do this? And then Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, answered, Leaders of the people and elders, are we being examined today because something good was done for a sick person? A good deed that healed him? If so, then you and all the people of Israel need to know that this man stands healthy before you because of the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, and he has now become the cornerstone. Salvation can be found in no one else. Throughout the whole world, no other name has been given among humans through which we must be saved. And so the religious leaders, the experts, had the same questions as the rest of Jerusalem. How are you doing this? They didn't get it. And Peter says it's by the name of Jesus Christ. And salvation can be found in no one else. Throughout the whole world, no other name has been given among humans through which we must be saved. And so this is a really big deal. This is something that they had to understand. And as believers, we understand that the power to perform miracles and the gift of salvation comes from Jesus Christ. But to understand how big a deal this is for Peter and John and the rest of the disciples to be doing these things and sharing the gospel, we have to understand where they're doing it, right? Remember again, 40, 50 days earlier, the guy had just been killed. The Son of Man had just been killed for this, and now they've set aside their fear 
and they are out telling the story, knowing that they're walking in his footsteps, knowing that they are likely to suffer the same fate. And they're still doing it. Uh, <laughs> I've run down here. Their mom must have never asked them what they would do if their friend walked off a cliff, right? <laughs> they're doing the same thing. They're following him just like the sheep running off, like Rob Blankenship showed us. The sheep's just running off the hill, right? They're following Jesus blindly. And so not only is it a hostile environment that they're preaching at, um, but they've shouted it to thousands of people. And uh, I like to work in smaller groups. <laughs> I've spoken to 200 people, um, but they're preaching to thousands. So not only is it hostile and violent, but they're in front of thousands of people. Um, so if 5,000 believed, how many others were standing there with pitchforks against them, right? So they might have been speaking to 5,000. There might have been 50,000 there. And so that was enough to get them arrested. And the next audience for them to speak at is basically like you going to Congress, right? They're arrested, brought before the Sanhedrin. You've been arrested and taken before Congress, and now it is your job to tell them how you just did this. And they're telling Congress, they're telling the Sanhedrin that a message that they know will likely get them killed. But Peter's now speaking with power. He's speaking with faith. He's speaking with obedience. And he says, we've got nothing to hide. By the name of Jesus, this man stands healthy and whole. The man you killed, the stone you cast away is now the cornerstone on, that all of this is built on. And the only way that you can be saved, and he's telling the Sanhedrin this, he's telling the Sadducees this, the only way you can be saved is through him. And if we would all just speak that boldly every time we speak about our faith in Christ, but it's because Peter understood his story, he understood his Christ, he understood the mission of Christ, and there was nothing that could hold him back. And so, what is your story? Our purpose on earth is to glorify Christ. It doesn't matter where you are and where you're doing it, our job is to glorify Christ. And it can't just be Pastor Leah. It can't just be Amy leading VBS. It can't just be Shannon talking to our youth. It can't just be Scott singing. Right? It can't just be the Baptist church. It can't just be a social media person. It can't just be the Catholic church. It can't be just those people. It has to be you. With your story and with Christ's message in your story. And as you read further in Acts, Peter says that we must obey God rather than men. We can't help but to speak about what we've seen and heard. And so... I want you to think about your story and I want you to write it down. Write down your story. Write down how you've been impacted. Write down where Jesus is in your story and get it in your head. Lay it all out. And then we've got to tell it to people. It doesn't have to be fancy. You just have to recall what you've seen and what you've heard. Look for Jesus in that story and tell somebody about it. But we can't just tell them our story and tell them Christ's story. We've got to show them that Jesus is in their story as well. Make sure they know that Jesus is in their story too. Tell them that from the beginning of time, Jesus has been here. Tell them that Jesus has known their name since the day they were born, since before they were born. That he knows that this world is broken, and that's the reason he came and he died to save us. He knows there's sorrow and there's pain and that we're looking for something better and he has the solution for that. He is the solution. Let them know that he died to provide that salvation to the world. He offered it to the ones that killed him first and now he's offering that salvation, that same forgiveness to all of us. He brings hope and he brings peace and if we have faith and we believe and we follow him, we have the forgiveness and we have to accept that gift of salvation. And to go out and glorify God by witnessing this to the rest of the world. Know your story. 
Would you all pray with me? God, I pray that there is a Holy Spirit fire in us today, that we would be bold enough to tell your story anywhere you send us. I thank you for the presence you have in each and every one of our lives. Open all of our eyes to see the miracles around us, to see you working near us, to see you saving your children. Light us up and send us out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please stand and join us now for our closing song this morning, Cornerstone. Write down your story, figure out what that is, and tell it. 
I just pray that God lights us up and he sends us out. Y'all are dismissed. Thank you.